Uh, I didn't do this. I'm going to do a short lecture on scanning. Uh, I didn't do this at the beginning of the semester because there was no lab associated with it. Here's a trick question. Here's a, um, a keyboard with 16 uh, keys on it. Okay? And so I asked the question, how many wires will it take to interface 16 keys? Uh, let me ask a different question. You got your laptop out, right? 100 keys, approximately. 100 keys on your keyboard. How many wires is it going to take to interface 100 keys? A thousand keys. I, I got a, I got a, I got a touchscreen. Millions of keys. How many wires is it going to take? You can see that if you hooked up one switch to, to every pin on your microcontroller, you'd quickly lose, lose, uh, lose hope. And so uh, we are going to, um, we are going to solve this problem with scanning. All right. So there's my keyboard. Uh, the other problem with keys is they bounce, and as we saw, we solved bouncing uh, in an earlier lecture. Okay. So here's the wrong way to do it, and that is to hook up, uh, you know, hook up um, one key to each port. And so if I have uh, n switches, it's going to require n ports and n plus one wires in this cable. Right. Uh, and you can see that this um, keypad has got only eight wires, okay. only eight wires, even though it has 16 keys, because it uses a technique called scanned. And there it is right there. Here's the eight wires, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, in a matrix. Um, and I'm going to use a I'm going to use a technique called open collector or open drain, such that the output of the rows here is either zero or high impedance floating. Okay? And what I'm going to do to scan this is I'm going to send exactly one row low, and the other rows I'm going to uh, set the high impedance, and then I'm going to read the four bits. And if, a, if all the switches, so for instance, if this is a zero, high Z, high Z, high Z, um, I am able to interrogate the status of those four switches on these four lines. And now one by one scan it. It's a little bit slow, but it does save me lots of wires. Um, so for uh, my 100 keyboard, 100 key keyboard, how many wires am I going to need? 20, right? Tw well, tw 21, yeah, 20 wires and 20 pins, 10 rows, 10 columns. Okay, so that's still a lot. Okay, that's still a lot. Uh, again, this is the scanning pattern. I'm going to drive, ex at any given time, I'm going to drive exactly one row uh, low. Uh, my advice, if you're actually writing software, is if you set a row and then you read the columns, I would put a small delay, yeah, a microsecond or so, in between there because the capacitance in that cable generally takes a while for that, because you got pull-up resistors and generally takes a while for that to show up on the keyboard and microcontrollers have gotten so fast that if you set the row and read the column immediately uh, you're liable to miss it um, as it's switching around so I wait a little bit of time between it and then you're gonna do this four times right you're gonna do this four times All right. Uh, so in particular uh, if switch 5 is the only one pressed uh, I'm going to get all ones when I scan the first row. I'll see the five here when I scan the second row, and I'll get all ones. So this pattern uh, is unique for the key number five. Uh, it's got a bug, by the way, a flaw, and that's called. Um, uh, let's look. Let's look at what would happen if I have three keys pressed that form a a, a rectangle. So. Uh, pick any, pick another key for me. Pick one. 
you know, six. six, okay, all right, and two, all right, there you go. Okay, those three keys are in a rectangle, see that? Okay. So now let's look at what happens when I scan this pattern. Three keys being pressed, you know, he's got his fingers on three keys at a time. When I scan the first row, what am I going to see, right? This guy's going to go zero because the two is there, okay? But interesting, what is this bit right here, okay? Let's look at this voltage right here. This voltage is zero, right? So this voltage is zero. So what can you tell me about this voltage right here? It's zero. So what can you, and, and six is touched. So that one showed zero. So it turns out that these keys will automatically make it look like three is pressed. So if you, in a scanned matrix, if you drive three keys in a, in a rectangle, it'll look like the fourth key is pressed. But any two key, any zero, one, or two keys works, but three keys do not work. All right. So what if I have more keys, right? I want a hundred, a thousand, a million. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to use a, a multiplexer and a demultiplexer. All okay? right. So uh, for example, uh, let's look at uh, let's look at 10, if I have 10 rows, okay, how many bits, and if you think about the pattern, what can you tell me about the pattern, right, only one is on at a time. So I'm only going to generate 10 different patterns. So what I'm going to do is use a 4 to 10 bit converter, okay, okay, this one's actually uh, 16 by 16. This is 256 keys here. So up to 256 keys are in this in this in this matrix, uh, and it's going to have to have right 32 wires. Right, it's going to have 16 rows and 16 columns, but I can interface it with only uh, eight bits. So I'm going to drive this pattern here now becomes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 15. And similarly, if I throw away the desire to get two keys pressed at a, at a time and only interested in 0 or 1 keys, uh, I am going to be able to simplify this interface as well and use a multiplexer such that the location of a zero, so if a zero is in the fifth, if a zero is in the fifth column, then this number will become a five. Okay? And so again, I'm going to scan down here just like I did the regular one, but uh, uh, to technically speaking, I'm going to need one more pin here uh, to handle the no key pressed. Okay, so uh, technically speaking, this 256 key. Uh, matrix multiplexed keyboard is going to require uh, nine pins. Okay? Uh, and this is the way, uh, and so on your regular keyboard, we're going to do it this way, except for the shift key, the alt key, the, you know, the things that you would normally hit two or three at the time, function key. So re the regular A, B, C, one, two, three keys are, are done in this matrix. Any questions on this? All right. All right, now for the fun. Uh, this is a um, eight key, eight, um, eight row by 64 column uh, keyboard uh, display, obviously. Uh, I scavenged this out of an old uh, um, slot machine. They were upgrading to uh, prettier displays, and so uh, reverse engineer. This thing has got the hugest MOSFETs on it, and we'll see why in a moment. Uh, but again, eight rows by um, by 64 columns, and each of the each of the LEDs is a two-bit LED. And with a two-bit LED, how many colors can you make? Trick question. Millions, by the way, because I can oscillate the colors together. So, for instance, if I if I can do green and yellow, and I oscillate them, I can make an orange. By the way. But, so you have lots of colors, okay? It's only a two bit, but from an interface standpoint, it's got, um, from an interface standpoint, 
uh, it's got 128 bits along the columns and eight bits along the rows. And I'm, I'm a big train guy, so it's all, uh, and, and you saw the TA who made this for me, his name was Robin, by the way, in case you missed the subliminal thing. Uh, it just like the keyboard, you know, you can have one LED to one pin, or you can put the LEDs in a, uh, in a matrix and have it N by N plus N, or you can, or you can use the demultiplexers. And so this particular, this entire uh, configuration is done with about seven wires right about here, about seven wires right about here, uh, because it uses a great big shift register uh, and SPI to hit the 128 bits. So uh, how many pins, that was, a, that was an exam question, how many pins does it take to do SPI output? From outputting to a whole bunch of SPI, I got, uh, I've got 128 divided by 8, right? That's uh, uh, seven shift registers. I have seven shift registers, all concatenated together. And I'm using SPI. How many pins do I need? I need clock. I need data. I'm going to need the latch pin. I'm going to need the latch pin because I've got I to gotta tell the device which of the bytes is whose. So I'll drive the latch low, I'll shift in seven things, drive the latch high, and everybody will take their shot, okay, so that it doesn't jumble around. Okay, so I'm going to need three pins for SPI. So three pins gives me 128 bits of output. Okay? And then to drive the columns, I'm going to need three more bits into a multiplexer, because again, I don't have to, I'm not going to drive any more than one row at a time. So I've got six bits power and ground, I can do this whole interface. Okay, next, let me show you how the hardware works. If you look at each individual LED, okay, uh, and there are 128 across in this direction, and 8 across in this direction. But if you look at each individual LED, and we make the statement that we'd like to ge generate 2 volts, 10 milliamps, a typical LED value, the circuit to drive this display has a set of p-channel transistors to drive each of the columns, and it has a set of n-channel transistors to drive the rows. So in order to turn it on, we will select a column and drive current into the top of the column, and then we will select a row and sync the current out of that row. But the currents can get very large. So if one of these rows is on, right? If one of the rows is on, and this is a high, and this transistor is on, that is a row, okay? But if all 128 LEDs along this row happen to be on, then that will generate 128 times 10 milliamps, or 1.28 amps, will have to be uh, driven through this n-channel transistor. But wait, it gets worse. The way this software works is we're going to scan one row at a time. And that means that in this particular display, since I have eight rows, an LED that is going to be on is on for one-eighth of the time. And so what I'm going to do is in order to make it look bright, I'm going to look at the energy. The energy, which is power times time, or voltage times current times time. And so in order to get the energy, the brightness that I want, uh, the voltage is going to be fixed here at 2 volts. But in order to make it bright, I'm going to have to put in 80 milliamps when it's on for one-eighth of the time in order to get the brightness that I want. Uh, unfortunately, that now means that this number here is now eight times higher. Okay? So again, when this LED is on, uh, the column is going to drive 80 milliamps. But the rows 
could potentially have to sink up to uh, 1.28 times 8, uh, which is about 10 amps. So this is a fairly hefty MOSFET driver here. Uh, and if you want to calculate the resistor, you can do it this way. Uh, this is the resistor calculation. Again, the difference is I am going to be driving eight times as much current as I want, and the voltage drop uh, is the five volts here minus the collector emitter voltage of the P channel minus the two volts of the diode uh, minus the collector emitter of the N channel. All right, the software is pretty straightforward. Uh, you turn off the display so it doesn't jitter while you're shifting things around. You shift 128 bits in, you latch them, you select the row, and then you re-enable it, and then you go away, right? So this is going to happen a thousand times per second, and so every millisecond a different row is driven, which means I get through all the rows in eight milliseconds, and one over eight milliseconds is what's that 125 Hertz and so the thing is oscillating at 125 Hertz your eyes can't tell okay? that's how this thing works so uh, the software has got a cool data structure called a double buffer uh, double buffer is a data flow uh, data flow structure uh, give me the other two examples of flow structures in this class there are two structures that will flow data between modules I got a foreground and a background, and I'm going to slide data from the foreground into the background because it's an output display. A mailbox, right? You put something in, set a flag. What's the other one? My favorite one. FIFO. The answer is always FIFO. <laughs> Not always, but you should always think about it. You know, what should we have for lunch? FIFO, you know. <laughs> Double buffer is actually a FIFO, if you get technical about it, that is very wide. In this case, I'm going to capture an entire image of my entire display, right? You think about 128 bits across, 8 bits down, whatever, that's uh, 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 1,024 bits. Uh, the entire buffer is captured, the entire display is captured in a buffer. But there, and my FIFO is too deep. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the buffers uh, called the front buffer. I'm going to use it to punch up the display. And then I'll use the back buffer in the software to recreate the next image. So as I'm creating the next image, I'll draw it in the back buffer as I'm moving stuff around. And, and then all of a sudden, I'm going to swap the pointers. Okay. And the background thread goes, I don't see any difference. I'm just outputting what you tell me to output. So I'll flip the front bumper down to the other one and then start drawing in the other buffer. And as long as I can stream the data until I get to the end, uh, I'm, I'm, this will always display what it sees in the front buffer, which is what you see with the front of your eyes rather than the back, which you don't see. So double buffer, fun data structure. All right, uh, questions? So the moral of the story is, if you've got a lot of things, you've got a lot of things, and you want to hook it up to a few pins, you use SPI, okay, and use a shift register. It gives you lots, okay. The other is you use multiplexers and demultiplexers if you can to take a few bits and make a lot. And thirdly, you scan it, and that is. Since humans are so stupid and slow, we can trick them into seeing things that don't exist by doing them one bit at a time. Okay? And that's the way all these displays work.